Dorothy Rowe. Oh my God. I've been looking forward to this conversation ever since uh, we first chatted. Uh, you are awesome. And I want to take the time to go ahead and introduce Dorothy. So Dorothy went through a transformation of awareness in 2008 when she began using uh, her uh, lifelong ability to see subtle strata of creation to heal herself and others. You know, Dorothy witnesses and reports the healings performed by the one eternal source, right? Divine being. Uh, Dorothy's profound understanding of the manifesting uh, process allows her to report extraordinary details of healing transformations, of energy work to her clients, right? Her, her goal is to enable all her clients to develop their own abilities for autonomous self-healing. Oh, I love that. Uh, Dorothy offers private consultations, workshops, webinars, and distance, right? Remote uh, energy work sessions. And you can find her at www.distanceenergywork.com. And today we'll be exploring the mechanics of how awakened consciousness can create practical transformations that benefit personal health and the whole field of life at the same time. Dorothy, how the heck are you? Well, <laughs> thank you, Joshua. <laughs> people now now everybody knows yep. hey, now <laughs> everybody knows the whole story there yeah it's wonderful to be here thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this summit i feel that the overarching theme of the summit which is relief from pain and from mm -hmm. chronic pain and from you know the those deeper values of experience that really that that confound people like this is the is like the heart of what we're all looking at yeah. as far as the evolutionary path that's in front of us. And I, yeah, I really appreciate that you have the courage and the, the wisdom mm. to create a summit around an issue that's not like just sort of a, like a la la kind of happy, but, <laughs> but is actually like the core principle that this is a core fundamental challenge that we're all that people deal with that everybody deals at some point or another, everybody deals with. Well, I mean, I wouldn't have US gotten alone. to where I am if I hadn't had to deal also with pain and situations and you too, right? Yep. So, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to turn an experience like that around and actually be able to help others also. So mm, I'm well, grateful to be here for that opportunity as much as any, everything and anything else that might come out from today's talk. Well, uh, thank you so much for your kind words. And, and really, I mean, in the US alone, there's 25 million people who suffer from chronic pain. That's not, I mean, that's pain in the body. That's not depression. That's not anxiety. That's not PTSD, right? right. That's just chronic pain. And that's in the U S. Uh, and so when we, you know, this is an international event. And so to have people around the world that can tune in and actually find, you know, ex experts like yourself that can actually share how people can find ways to, to not even escape it. Right. But to step out of it and to step into a new life. Mm -hmm. beautiful beautiful yeah and i definitely feel that part of that story has to do with the way the individual positions themselves in relationship to that experience internally mm. because the, we do have some choices we do but the choices that we make are informed by the sense of who we are as an individual so often underlying those painful experiences are feelings of worthlessness and not good enough and disposable and yeah you know, i'm i'm under resourced i don't have the resources i need to deal and all, all these types of feelings and those feelings those feeling and we could say those beliefs in oneself that were kind of small and insignificant and unimportant and long list underneath that is a feeling of being disconnected from the source of creation mm. so what i've found over time is that this fundamental step of finding one's roots, finding one's anchor back to the source of creation is one of the really powerful keys that we have as individuals to navigating our way out of pain from the inside out. And that's why I have this picture behind me, because the picture represents, it's like a map of consciousness. It's a map of reality, we could say. And in my picture, the water represents the source of creation, mm -hmm. the unmanifest, eternal, unbounded, divine, absolute being, pure consciousness, pure awareness. We can give it a million names, but it's that one fundamental field of unmanifest qualityless being that gives rise to the whole manifest field of creation. And then the, the top of my picture, some like clouds and mountains, um, mm. represents the manifest 
ocean of what we think of as our universe, our manifest field of the universe, including our physical bodies, and including even things that we can identify, such as thoughts and feelings, right? Even imp impulses or, or inspirations or all that or something tangible. And, and some of it's really concrete, like it's the physical body concrete, and mm -hmm. some of it is more abstract. So in my picture back here, the deeper levels, closer and closer you get to the ocean of unmanifest being, the more abstract the form becomes. And this is, from my perspective as a healer, this, is, this map is really important. And I can just say to everybody, I didn't create this map. I certainly have created in my own work a kind of a scaffolding or a way of understanding consciousness, but it really comes from my training in meditation because I became a meditation teacher when I was 25. It was a long time ago. Oh, and uh, not my, that long ago. <laughs> thank you. That's sweet of you. I guess in the if in the in the perspective of the whole universe, it was not very long ago. <laughs> Just a little blip. Yeah. But, but my meditation teacher when I was learning how to give other people the experience of transcending or going beyond thought, mm -hmm. um, I was given this diagram that looked like a, you know, it showed like the ocean of being, unmanifest being, little bubbles of thoughts coming up from the ocean and then popping up into the surface of oh, the thinking yeah. process. And it was brilliant. It was simple. It was simple and it, it gives us the opportunity to think of the field of our own consciousness as a little bit like an ocean. and to redefine ourselves in terms of our unbounded nature as individuals, that yes, we have physical bodies that are constrained by space and time, but we also have within us the ocean of our consciousness, and we have our connection to the source of creation, and that's not bound by space and time, mm. right? So, I mean, for example, what the scientists say, oh, the fastest thing in the universe is the speed of light, right? Well, it takes like 8.2 minutes for the light to get from the sun to the earth, but it takes no minutes for this, your consciousness, for your awareness to go to the sun to the earth. In mm. fact, consciousness is so flexible. You can go to the sun, to the earth, and you can come back before you left or anything, right? Because we can go to the ends of the universe and back in no time, no time. And so consciousness awareness, awareness is a field of all possibilities. The ocean of being that's the source of everything is a field of all ocean of all possibilities. And it is an ocean of pure awareness. And so from my perspective, energy healing and navigating one's way out of pain mm -hmm. is a process of focusing awareness in a really intelligent manner, in a way that's, that takes into consideration the laws of nature of how one unbounded ocean of consciousness becomes the manifest field, including the physical body, including pain, including everything that we experience. And so if we take into account these laws of nature of how one becomes many, then the process of focusing awareness intelligently becomes better informed. And instead of just sort of rambling around in the area, one becomes concise and discerning and, um, and careful and begins to recognize or identify the different laws of nature as they appear within the cycle of creation. Because there's a cycle, right? From the one becomes many, but then it dissolves back into one again. And, and that's the, this makes a cycle. And the cycle is an eternal cycle that's been part of our world and our culture for as long as there are people, as long as there are storytellers, as long as there have been storytellers, there has been the story of the hero. And you mentioned the little figurines on your. Yep. So I got some figurines. Picture. We were talking a little bit. Yes, uh, yes, in yes. The green room. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. And I, I feel that those, the way you've got the figurines arranged there mm -hmm. represents your also some understanding, your, your understanding, the way it processes and, and filters through your nervous system uh, of this cycle of creation, because it's, it's an, not only an internal cycle, it's a cycle that's baked into every particle of creation, because it is the process by which the one shows up in physical material form and then dissolves back into the ocean of wholeness, of bliss, the home of bliss, uh, eternal being. And so... Understanding and recognizing the phases of that cycle really gives a person great autonomy over their own behavior and their own 
I would say, positioning or approach to whatever experience is coming up. So in the case of pain or chronic pain, you know, one has to, one is searching usually desperately to find how can I position myself so this pain is not so extreme or mm -hmm. how can I position myself so whatever is the underlying cause of this pain can be dealt with and then the pain be eliminated, right? And so understanding the cycle of creation is very helpful in that process. Oh, I love that. Well, and you said so much and you shared so many gems. And, you know, one thing, just looking at the, at the ocean there, it reminds me of, you know, Rumi's quote that, you know, we we're not a drop in the ocean. We're the ocean in a drop, right? This oh. is like the, the fragmentation of, right. Of, of the all, right. We are a piece of the all, right. The piece of, you know, you can call that the God self, call that whatever. And what I really love about the mist, you right. Almost like these mists of Avalon in the mountains behind is that that's the mist of, of, of mystery. And behind that is the manifestation, <laughs> Right. And then the, and when you connect to the mystery and then you manifest it into your world and you have faith to keep going, Hey, all I see is water guys. All I see is water. What do I do? Well, I have faith. Do you, I mean, are, are, is your heart and mind congruent? Well, how can you tell through meditation? Like you were talking about. And yeah. you, you also mentioned some things about um, thoughts. And it's really interesting. Cause I, I uh, pulled a uh, half of a quote off of your website that I really, really liked and it says, may every impulse of life flowing through us fortify the relationship between ourselves and our bodies. May we cherish our precious bodies through thought, speech, feeling, and action. And I certainly have my own ideas of why that's important, but I'm wondering if you can share for us in the audience of why it's so important to be charitable with our thoughts, especially oh, to thank ourselves. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for finding that. That was cool that you looked for that, Joshua. Thanks. Um, it may seem as if the journey of awareness into the source of creation is, is the sort of like the, the goal or it's sort of the, it, it is a foundation. The experience of the source of cre creation, fair enough, is uh, fundamental to both the healing process and to just living life effectively. However, however, in that cycle of creation, there's a whole section which is integrative. There's a purifying and integrative aspect. There are, there are particular laws of nature of purification and integration, which are where the rubber meets the road as far as liberating oneself from pain. Mm. And so as I mentioned, awareness can move in an instant anywhere. It can go to the source of creation instantly, anytime. It's one of the things I love about you, Joshua, is when you listen, I can tell that your awareness is anchored. Mm. Yeah, and I hope the audience can see that too, because it's beautiful. It's one of the things that's really beautiful about you. Your awareness is very anchored in wholeness, and you're and it, the wholeness radiant is a radiance in you. It radiates from you. So even when you're saying nothing, you're radiating, which is really beautiful. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because I can, I can feel my Taurus just like this is expanding. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's beautiful. So, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's, it, really it's beautiful. fun. It's fun when you talk to people who are sensitive to energy and they can pick that up. Um, yeah. But the yeah, point well, is I appreciate that, you saying that. that part, so that part, like that's really important. That's like a fundamental aspect of the whole thing. But the other side of it, which I feel um, in our modern culture and also even in the field of energy healing and certainly in the field of mystical experiences, certainly in that field, the integrated, the purification and integration side of the cycle is kind of ignored. Uh, on a lot of, at a lot of times, people are like going for that big God presence experience, but they're not, they're not pulling it in and baking it into the fabric of their, their physical form. And I mean, we're lucky, right? We have human bodies. Like we could have been like plants or animals or something, but here we are, we're humans, right? And humans are very cool. Honestly, we have these lovely thick prefrontal cortices and, you know, interesting nervous systems that allow us to focus our awareness in ways that other beings can't. And so, and even angels, even, even subtle beings, which we could, that's like a whole area of discussion. But anyway, um, because we have human bodies, our awareness has the opportunity to be anchored in the material field of creation while also experiencing 
the unbounded eternal source of creation. We have this ability that beings whose bodies are made only of light do not have that anchor. We have, it's our anchor, it's our anchor, our bodies are anchor into the material level of creation. And it's at the material level of creation where a lot of very exciting evolutionary work takes place. And it's not just individual evolution, it's the evolution of the one. The source of creation itself is evolving through us. Sometimes I would ask people like, what if you were God? Like, what if you were God? Like, you know everything, you are everything, you are everywhere, you're all powerful, you're not missing anything. <laughs> wrong. You're missing something. You're missing something because if you know everything and you are everywhere, you're missing being surprised. You're mm. missing learning new things. You're missing having that, oh my God, experience that, oh, aha, like, like, like ding, 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 like the lights yeah. go off experience. You miss that experience if you literally know everything. So what God does, because, but God wants that experience because that experience is a quintessential component of the evolutionary process, right? And, and the evolutionary process is what this whole cycle of creation is all about. It's about evolving. And it's also what pain is about. Pain fits into that cycle. And so being able to isolate one's pain in context of that cycle, I think is a very essential step in actually rising up out of the pain and overcoming it. Just saying, it's my personal opinion. But anyway, the point is that, was there a point in there? I guess, I guess. So the divine makes humans. It makes humans with human nervous systems that are like, like Rumi's quote, you know, we are like the human physiology is the drop and we are the ocean and we're the ocean in a drop. And so the drop becomes like a filter that experiences reality in a linear unfoldment of, of moments, right? So this moment, now this moment, now this moment, we're bound by space and time because of the construction of our nervous systems. We're bound to experiencing, having one thought at a time because of our nervous systems. And as a result, we have the capacity to be amazed. Mm. We have the capacity to appreciate the phenomenal glory of the creation in a way that the divine which creates the creation would might simply just be like take itself for granted yeah. basically if it weren't for us if it weren't for us and so we're precious we are precious because of that even people who don't consider themselves self spiritual or don't care about their spiritual evolution or any evolution or anything it doesn't matter if you breathe if you breathe, you go through this process of the infinite unbounded to the individuality, and then it causes purification. Mm. Purification occurs, and the integration of all that's good in the air occurs, and then you do it again. So it's the eternal, and then the individual, and the eternal, and the individual, and just breathing alone is enough to cause integration during the course of a lifetime that allows the soul to evolve. Well, and I think, um, well, again, you, I mean, you put so much and pack so much in that. And uh, I think coming back to your idea of people aren't necessarily looking to integrate, I think that uh, because we have been taught to be afraid of the divine feminine, right? And uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, think, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one here, but all throughout my life, you know, as I was growing up as a kid, people be like, Hey, Josh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm like, Oh man, I want to be a Marine biologist. And they're like, Boom. they don't make any money. What a dumb <laughs> idea. Why don't you go ahead and try something else that my limited perception thinks that you'd be good at. And that would make you money. And what it did is it taught me not to trust my inner voice, but the um... inner voice is that divine feminine. Right, that's what allows things to, to, to come to us. I was, you know, speaking with a uh, um, with a shaman, and he talked about the difference between the eagle and the condor. Right, the the condor is the feminine energy, right, that waits for the food to come to it, and then it goes and it devours, right. And then, whereas the eagle is what goes out and gets. But we're so enamored with the eagle, but the eagle is what goes and soars and and finds the world. But the condor is who finds himself, and mm -hmm. when when you find yourself or herself. Right. You're going to find that integrative process. Um, it's not only is it not scary, but it's beyond liberating. Right. And what I mean by scary is right. I'm a, I'm a combat veteran and, you know, people who have experienced combat, it can, um, can really mess with your noodle big time. And what happens there is again, people are afraid of their inner voice. 
because their inner voice has been hijacked. They've been told that they can't trust themselves. They've been told this story that they internalize. And part of you know where I see a lot of beauty in your quote that I mentioned about why we should be charitable, you know, with our thoughts, our speech, you know, and our feelings, is that you know Bruce Lee used to talk about this. Um, you know that to be very careful about how you talk to yourself because your body can't help but to listen. And we cast spells on ourselves all day long. And here we are saying these words and these stories that immediately we assume, and our bodies are like, okay, well, because the in inside the body, you talked about the nervous system. Around every cell is a membrane, and around and that what does that membrane do? That membrane says, hey, what environment am I in? Right? Is it raining? Is it snowing? Is it sunshine? And if you know, if it's dark and rainy, but we want to feel sunshine, well, if we've only been thinking dark and rainy thoughts, well, where's how's the sun going to come out? Right? If we've only been feeling dark and rainy feelings, well, how's the sun going to break through? Right? And so understanding that, and then understanding also that when we change the way in which we think and change in which the way in which we feel, there's still the law of inertia, right? In this case, it's cell inertia which means that the cells are still going to be like, Hey, what, what the hell we're still, we're dressed for rain, man. What, what are you doing? Bringing the sun out. Right. And how much easier is it to change, you know, to change the minds of about 50 trillion cells versus your own individual mind. Right. And this is why when we, when we step out to try to find a new way to live a new way to, you know, to, to find ourselves in the world, we might find that we yo-yo right back to where we were because we haven't provided enough of a force right? To break that inertia and to actually part those clouds and allow the, the sun to shine in. Yeah, it's a beautiful point. It's a beautiful point that the communication, the laws that govern the communication between the body and the mind, and the consciousness, we could say the consciousness and the body are not equally distributed. Mm. You know, I think, I mean, I think that's part of your point. For instance, um, if I want to put my my hand like that on my nose, which I just did. I didn't have to think it. I didn't because my body reads my consciousness phenomenally. The level, the communication flow from the consciousness to the body is so instant and it's so complete. It's so integrated, really, speaking mm -hmm. of integration. However, when the body wants to talk to the consciousness, it has a very limited vocabulary. The body really only talks in like sensations and feelings, basically. And the consciousness has to figure out what the body needs. And, and it's a little bit like a mama trying to figure out what the baby needs, right? The baby cries. Well, it could be hungry, or the baby could be overly tired, or maybe needs a change or, or something else is happening. You know, maybe there's a little bubble of gas in there somewhere. And, you know, in those early days with the baby, there's a, there's a really steep learning curve for the parents and for the mama, especially because she has primary responsibility usually. And, um, and it's, it's a little tricky. And, and when a person steps onto that path of bringing the consciousness and the body together in a unified relationship that will be, um, that's like a teamwork, right? That they work together to help perpetuate better health and evolution and all that. Uh, there's a learning curve mm -hmm. for the consciousness, for the consciousness, because the body doesn't need any learning curve. The body's like this devoted servant to the kind, you can say to your body, oh, go jump off a cliff. And the body will go, oh, yes, sir, whatever you say, whatever you say, just, you know, whatever, <laughs> eat, you know, eat this food that isn't good for me or whatever, whatever, then the body will just do it, right? And uh, even against its own best interests, the body will do it. But the consciousness, on the other hand, carries the responsibility like the parent. The consciousness carries more responsibility for the well-being of the body and yet has, has to learn how to read the body. And so what I found is that part of that story is to read the moment. Mm. Because in the present moment, like you were saying, like if it's raining outside or if it's sunny outside, right? And in the present moment, all the previous moments that have ever occurred inform the present moment. And all the moments that are yet to come also reflect into the present moment. And if a person is uncertain about what resources they need in the present moment, because it's infinite laws of nature, 
but we're only going to be drawing in at any given moment some limited number of those laws of nature in order to inform the highest possible behavior, the highest, the best, highest, and best choices. So the what I found is that bringing the awareness here, and this also, this isn't for me. Again, this isn't for me. My foundation is more Vedic science. So this actually comes from Maharshi Patanjali, who lived like Oh, around 15, 13 or 1500 BC, something like that. Anyway, he figured this out. He figured this out, that if you bring your awareness into the present moment and you take this moment and you line it up within the sequence of all the moments that came before and all the moments that shall come after, by doing so, it causes the mind to become like a magnet that draws in exactly the laws of nature that you need in this moment. Mm -hmm. Well, and what I really love about that too, is that um, people often will try to manifest for a day or two and they're like, well, this is bunk. I try to manifest and it didn't work. Well, let's go back to those laws of nature you're talking about, right? So in quantum physics, um, right, you've got a wave of possibility, right? Which is effectively all a particle is, um, is exists as a wave of possibility until we observe it into collapsing into a particle reality. And right. if it's a wave, and let's say, you know, for instance, it being governed by, say, the, the speed of light, and the speed of light is 186, you know, thousand miles a second. Well, as soon as the, it uh, it collapses into particle reality, do you know the speed of our eyes to uh, to our brain? No, I don't know. About 250 miles an hour. And oh, so th wow. think of the arithmetic, 186,000 oh, wow. miles a second, and then it collapses into our reality. It's going to take a little bit. Right. It might take a few weeks yeah. for it to actually catch yeah. up because now it's slowed down. Right. right. And, you know, and, right. you know, like you mentioned so eloquently with our, you know, with our nervous system in this three dimensional world, time moves linearly. That's not actually right. how time works in higher dimensions. Right. Um, but in, in our dimension, that's how it works. So it's already right. there, but we've got to catch up in, in, in the third dimension. And um, if people are saying, hey, what gives? I've been manifesting and there's, here's this thing that's coming at me saying uh, that's, that's in the uh, opposing idea of what it is I'm trying to manifest. And then I get angry and I get upset just to your point, right? Well, now the brain is channeling that the problem right. is, is it's channeling based upon the past. Right. Because it's still catching up. Beautiful this is what point. You were, beautiful point. This is what yes. you were manifesting up and for these weeks. And so you've got to, just like the cell inertia, you've got to go through your manifestation inertia and, yeah. and you've got to get that out. And then it starts to come. And then you start seeing, oh, wait a minute. You know, that's funny that this guy who, you know, lived, you know, 13, 1500 BC is saying things that now neuroscience is, and is, is you know, uh, corroborating. And it's funny that science now is almost like Eureka, look how smart we are. You know, this is actually a real thing when they're now just validating what it was that's been said for thousands of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ancients, they figured out a whole, whole bunch of stuff, but over the course of time, things get uh, forgotten. Knowledge, knowledge is forgotten. The, the thing about the nervous system, thank you for bringing that up about the nervous system, because it's, I think it's a really important point that um, we the nervous system is the filter for the consciousness and perception, you know, because the senses of perception have their cortices and so on. Um, but to me, it looks a little bit like a dialogue between the ocean of pure being and the physical body. It's like there's a kind of a dialogue that's going always back and forth, back. And it's part of that cycle. You could say it's a cycle of another way of looking at the cycle of creation, but. Mm, I'm just picking up that point. Yes, that we have a choice of where to place awareness or attention. We have a choice of where to focus and where we focus, wherever we focus has a very direct effect on the shape, the actual functioning of the nervous system. According to modern science, 70% of the dendrites in the brain and in the nervous system, central nervous system, restructure themselves every day. And that's based on experience. It's based on the things you do and food you eat and your experiences that you have and all that. And so what that means is that each one of us as an individual has a tremendous amount of autonomy over the shape, the actual physical structure of the filter of consciousness. And so making choices toward activities that increase stability and adaptability in the nervous mm. system, 
results in a nervous system that becomes a better carrier for consciousness, it becomes a better carrier for the one. And so part of the story, I think, of pain and of chronic pain is for the pain to act as kind of like a motivator to help the individual find the path of, for the focus of awareness that will have the most beneficial effect on the nervous system that will allow their nervous system to become the best possible carrier of the highest level of consciousness possible for them. And, you know, meditation is a great thing. Yeah. I'm a big advocate. I'm always, I've always been a big advocate for meditation, but, but also anything that refines anything that causes refinement and another area, a whole area where a person can focus that affects the nervous system in a very, very positive way are acts of devotion. Mm. Because when we combine devotion is like the marriage, you could say devotion is the marriage of love and service. It's, it's service lovingly performed. And service, of course, means thinking carefully, like, how can I do this action in the best possible way? So there's an intellectual component. But when that service is performed from a level of genuine love and appreciation for, you know, the other person or for God or whoever, however you're designing your acts of devotion, uh, what happens is it causes that intellectual side of the process to start to refer back to the feeling. So you have like the feeling of I love, you know, because I'm a mama, because I'm a mama or grandmama, which I am. So I love, you know, and I do things that are not necessarily completely 100% comfortable for me, but they're the things that are, are the most, will carry the best long term results, right? So whatever is going to carry some kind of really good, positive long term results, and it's done lovingly. And so what that does is it creates a relationship between the head and the heart. It really, it starts to cause integration to occur in this part of the physiology. And it's, it's very, very, has a very positive effect on the senses of perception. It will cause the senses of perception to start to look into the feeling aspect or the energetic structure behind what the person is doing, what you're doing at that time. Even if you're just doing something simple like cleaning your house or washing dishes or changing a diaper or, you know, different types of things or, or volunteering at a local uh, charity or something. It allows the senses of perception to be aware of the action on the surface and it allows the senses of perception to start to pay attention to what's going on deep inside at the same mm. time. It starts to bring that together. And the net result is that the senses of perception, which really are extensions of the nervous system become more refined I, and I, I awareness like starts to fathom into those deeper levels of creation. I, I like and that. That's lot, one right? of the reasons that's how I did it. That's one of like you gave in the intro. Mm -hmm. Dorothy, all these years, Dorothy had this sense of, was able to see into the fine fabric. That's how I did it. Exactly. Like, that's my secret. <laughs> was I was, I was a volunteer for world peace for like 35 years. Mm. While I raised my family. Well, and you know, before I could start seeing right yeah, with my eyes closed, right. True sight. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I had to have the dark night of my soul. Oh. I had to have everything collapse around me because what happened is the structures yes. I erected around my heart to protect me did nothing but confine me. And as soon as those structures fell, well, You're then so there was wise. that, there, there was, there was that, you know, uh, that link. It says, Hey man, finally, finally, you're willing to listen. And, um, you know, good I'm, job, Joshua, that's oh, powerful, thanks. man. That's powerful. It's good stuff. Well, and I'm curious um, your thoughts on this uh, this idea of you know I'm not a raging an outrageous fan of the Bible, but I do think that there's a lot of wisdom there. And one in particular you know piece in Genesis talks about the trees of you know of life and the trees of knowledge of good and evil. And I find that the tree of life means that you're living life, right? And when you live right? You're experiencing and experience is the number one teacher. And when you live, right, you're, you're out there and you're seeing how you can go ahead and affect the world around you, how you can make yourself better. But when you don't live, right, what's live backwards? Well, that's evil. Okay. Well, when you've oh. <laughs> lived, when you've lived, well, then, then you've, you've, you've harnessed all this wisdom, but when you haven't lived, well, that's the devil lived backwards is devil. 
Oh and, my goodness. I hadn't and, seen that. That's amazing. <laughs> and the, the devil we say, right? Lucifer, we say is the bringer of light, the bringer of knowledge, the one that convinces you that, Hey, you've got that, you know, that master's degree on the wall. I get that you just passed the test. I get that you've retained none of that knowledge, but look at you, right? You didn't experience life. You didn't live, but look at you, look how much better you are. And I find that the mind and, and, you know, the mind's where all the chatter is. It's where all the noise is. And where, where do we say the devil's where in the details, right? Mm. Right up here. And, but not here, right? This, like you said, you know, the, the body doesn't have the ability to use language, right? We say that a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, that's what the body does is it invokes feelings and pictures. It does. Yes. Words pictures, are these yes. fragmentations of these pictures, which means that when the body is saying, hey, or when the mind saying, hey, look at me, look how smart I am, look how great I am. Well, it's a thousand times less powerful. And what I find what it does is it confines the flow. When, when the mind is no longer acting as an antenna for the heart and it closes off like those structures around my heart I was talking about. Well, then it prevents that flow. And when you prevented flow, well, then what happens? Well, you get stagnating energy. And yeah. when you've got stagnating pools, what's attracted there? Well, parasites and mosquitoes. And when you've got parasites and mosquitoes, there draining the life force. Well, then the body and the mind, as a consequence, break down. And this yeah. is where I find chronic pain, whether, again, PTSD or pain in the body, you know, these dis-ease, right, of the body. And getting that flow again, you know, as I've found, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm is a wonderful way to, you know, the Tao talks about how if you give evil nothing to oppose, it'll go away on its own. Not because it's not there, but because you can step out of its way. And so these mosquitoes and these parasites, how do you get rid of them? Well, if you fight them, well, what happens if you're flopping your arms all around trying to fight these mosquitoes? Well, get your heart rate up, you start breathing more, and they're attracted to your carbon dioxide in the first place. But if you invite that flow, well, guess what? That flow is going to take that stagnant uh, water and it's going to go ahead and take it downstream. So now you've stepped out of the way. You're not actively fighting because as Carl Jung said, that which you resist persists. Right. If you resist your PTSD, if you resist your pain, if you're fighting it, well, you're opposing it. And so, as you said, with, with you know, meditation and with the pain maybe being a bit of a almost, you know, my words, propulsion mechanism to enlightenment, hey, what does this pain have to tell me? Mm -hmm. Is there something I'm doing that's counterproductive to my body? My body's giving me a warning sign. This is a, a dummy light that's coming on the dashboard of my car saying, hey, dummy, check this out. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on with your pain? Beautiful, beautiful. Yes, absolutely. And um, your point, yes. So I think that sometimes people are resistant to the feminine energy, but sometimes people are also afraid just of the evolutionary process. And um, like this, I'm leading into a reply to what you just said, which is that the blockage of the flow also can be because the evolutionary process necessarily will include purification and integration. And that's the, that's the point where I think the flow tends to get a little bit blocked up mm -hmm. because the source of creation wants to evolve. Okay. That's the reason why we have a universe is because the one doesn't want to be stagnant. Mm. It wants to have that evolutionary experience, right? So it, it rises up into the experience, but, but the evolutionary value of the experience is more important to, from a kind of universal perspective than comfort. So sometimes people get in from an individual perspective, they get kind of caught. Well, I just want to be happy. I want to be comfortable, right? Like that. But the problem is that sometimes the most important decisions that a person makes are not necessarily in terms of what is the most comfortable in the moment, but more in terms of what is the most evolutionary in the moment. And so that sh little shift can help a person unblock the flow um, by just shifting the priority a little bit, because if we are evolutionary in the moment, ultimately that does lead long-term to greater and greater comfort, higher and higher quality of life. Mm. Um, so that's part of it. I think sometimes people are afraid to evolve because evolution means 
they have to engage with the cycle of creation. They have to engage with the purification, with the purification process and the integration process. And those, as we discussed already, they take a little bit of time. It's not always easy. Purification means letting go, right? You have to let go of something. Like you said, when you went through the dark night of the soul, you know, everything that you had created and built up around you collapsed. And so like, it's, it can be horrifying to go through some. I also did the dark night of the soul experience, which was around that 2008 time that, yeah, when I had that experience. Um, yeah, it's something. So um, the thing about purification is that there are specific laws of nature that manifest during the, the part of the cycle. That's, so let's just look at the cycle briefly. So the source of creation is like a fountainhead. So constantly energy and resources and creativity and intelligence are pouring forth from the source of creation like that. And um, form is created. Form emerges from this pouring, from this offering, from the source of creation. And form, and I'd like to say a little something about that a little bit later, but anyway, so form rises up and the laws of nature are the laws of nature of expansion and stabilization of form. So form becomes more concrete, more definable, more um, well-expressed. And then there comes a point where this is what I wanted to say. There comes a point where the form itself, which is necessarily bound by the limitations of the manifest field, whether it's a subtle form or, or a concrete form, it's, it's bound. And there comes a point where the, the binding value causes that form to forget or not be able to associate or identify as much with the source of creation. The form finds itself limited in its ability to be a good vehicle. Mm. for that pure being. And at that moment that the form finds itself insufficient is the moment that the laws of nature shift and it goes into purification mode. The source of creation says, oh, you got away from me. Oh, I don't see you. Oh, the devil, right? It thinks the devil thinks of himself as bigger and better and separate from that one source of creation. The devil is not, nothing is, nothing exists outside of that one. But there's this illusion that I'm separate and that I'm different and that I'm a, and in, in that being, when the self-identity is gripped by that illusion, I'm different, I'm separate, I'm, I'm insufficient, I'm not, I'm not complete, right? Because this wholeness is complete, and, but I'm separate from the wholeness, so I'm incomplete. That's when the purification kicks in. And the purification, as you mentioned before, so aptly that the, the pain becomes a signal mm -hmm. from the body and from the environment that, that it's time to come home now, honey, <laughs> basically something yeah. like that. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like, oh, you got away from me. You think you're separate from me. You're not, yeah. you know, now it's time to come home. And so these new laws of nature kick in and they involve having to let go. You have to let go of all the bits and pieces about yourself that make you feel like you're separate from the source, from the one source of creation. And that can be, depending on how long the journey was, you know, coming up, you can feel like you're letting go, person's letting go of a lot, you know, like everything I created in my life even. Yeah. But once the letting go process kicks in, then, then there's this new laws of nature that involve letting go and wherever there's some little bit letting go divine grace comes into that empty space because nature abhors a vac vacuum right so so the you let go a little bit and then the divine comes in it's like oh actually i'm divine and then a little more you let go and then oh a little bit more divine comes in a little bit more you let go and it can, but it can be painful if there are attachments to that yep. now the thing i wanted to say and this comes back i i was saying that we could a little bit about subtle levels of ourself and mm -hmm. of the creation that bodies show up in lots of different forms. So we have physical human bodies that on my diagram, they show up here at the top of my diagram, but they're bodies that are just made of energy. They're like bodies, energy. And you talked about the devil, or we can talk about angels or all kinds of subtle beings of light. There are many, many, many forms, but all of it, all of it is contained within the context of each one of us because we are anchored to the source of creation and our physical body looks like it's bound by space and time. But the, the more we look at ourselves closer, 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 closer to the source of the creation, the more our bodies take on just the garb, the, the garment of light. And at the subtlest level of who and what we are, 
the field of our individual consciousness is quite extensive. It's as big as the ocean of the universe. It goes through all space and time. So we have parts of ourself that are not bound by space and time. And we have parts of ourself that are bound by space and time. And down at that area, not bound by space of time, there's in the gap in the relationship between the manifest field and the unmanifest field. That's where, that's where the rubber meets the road, in my opinion, with energy healing. That's where it's like the switchboard of nature's functioning, whereby bringing awareness there into that gap and then applying the intelligent application of mm -hmm. intention um, allows for a little shift, a tiny, tiny little shift down there in the source of right there next to the source that causes a great, like the butterfly effect, you know, and it causes a great shift at the surface. Mm -hmm. So with regards to manifestation or with regards to healing, we learn to bring the awareness down. But at one point I was looking down in this area and it looked as if there were fields and fields, oceans, like the waves on the surface of the ocean of the source of creation rising up in a form, a form of light. But even the forms of light sometimes feel themselves separate because first it's, it's just one quality less wholeness. And then it's like, oh, I'm something, I'm something, even though I'm maybe just a, a wave of light in, in the ocean of all light, but I, I feel myself something separate. And so that wave of light has to come home. It has to go through the cycle of creation. It can happen way down here, just, just down, just down there. It happens in those, those little waves that rise up and go, I'm a light being, but I'm not the ocean of pure consciousness. And so I have my own, I, I need to stabilize my individuality. And this is where we find demonic forms. These are what demonic forms are. They're subtle light body beings who see themselves as separate from the, from the source of all good, from the source of all positivity, of all life-supporting growth. And so they, they need their moments. Like you were saying, sometimes things need a little bit of time. They need their moments to like go, well, what is my physical form? I'm, I'm a, a wave of light. Okay. So I'm going to lean into my wave of light and be my wave of light. But then what the form realizes is I can't express my full potential unless I'm drawing upon the infinite resource from being. So it has to come home. So these little waves, they come up and they come down, they come up and they come down, they come up and they come down. Every time they dive back into the ocean of being, they come out with a physiology that's a little more refined and a little bit better vehicle, a little bit better expression of divinity. And over time, those little waves that saw themselves as separate, they see themselves as having their unique physiology, but really just being wholeness. Mm -hmm. I am just the ocean. And, and referring back to Rumi's quote, I'm so glad you brought that up, Joshua. That was beautiful. Um, at that point, they are angels. That's what angels are. Angels are forms of the source of creation that are able to rise up into their physicality, even if it's just a light body, but they're stable and adaptable enough that they know themselves to be divinity as a light body. I am a light body, but I am the divine showing up as a light body. And that's the same journey that we're on as humans, right? You go through that billions. We did that. That was us, man, billions of years ago, doing those little cycles and cycles and cycles and cycles until we could sustain our light body and never, never lose our connection to the source of creation. And then we got a little more manifest bodies up into the next layer of manifestation. And there's, so there's this deep, deep, deep layer. And then there's this next layer up, which is where where awareness really moves. Like at the first deep layer, it's more like the beings, the level of being there is quite radiant. It's like an, it's like a resonating space. Mm. This resonating space doesn't do much in my bottle until the light of consciousness goes in. And then suddenly something music suddenly becomes a musical instrument, right? It like, it becomes like, like a presence. It becomes a presence. The space inside this bottle becomes a presence when it, 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 it integrates with, with the life force, the life force. And if I don't like the sound that I'm getting out of it, I just change the shape. And that's how our causal bodies are. We just change the shape to make it more refined, more stable and adaptable. And then it becomes a resonator for divinity perfectly. But the next layer up, it's more like, it's like awareness on the move. So you, you come to a field of threads and uh, rivers, streams, uh, filaments, you could say. And I know people, and I haven't done ayahuasca trips because I'm, 
I'm not an advocate for drugs, just saying, but it's just, it's not, that's my personal thing. I'm not an advocating that, but uh, partly because I realized that part of the process is the integrative side and the drugs tend to give you that direct experience of, whoa, mind blow, mystical experience, but not the integration for the body that the body really needs. So, so from my perspective, there are ways to, to do that cycle of creation that are more efficient more efficient. So it's interesting you bring that up. Um, I have not done ayahuasca. I have done quite a few different uh, uh, psychedelics. Um, oh, yes, I have to. I, I have to. And that's why I'm not an advocate, right? Yeah. Because I've done them. I've done them. Yeah. And I know, and I know that they give you the, but then well, they don't give you the, they don't stabilize you back in. Right? Depending on who you, you know, you go to, like, there's a, there's a shaman here locally um, that my mom of all people turned me on to, right? Uh, and uh, <laughs> go they mom. Do, yeah, I know, right? They do uh, peyote ceremonies. Oh, yes, it's and, peyote, yes. And peyote is nothing like any other psychedelic. It doesn't make you trip. It may, it's it's all an internal journey. But then what you do is, with these people, you're sitting inside of a teepee, and then you you have a sacred fire you know, around you. And anyone who's purging, they purge it into the sacred fire, so the fire it consumes it. Uh, and then um, you're sharing, you're just sharing your deep vulnerabilities with people around you and connecting. And then the very next day they have a breathing ceremony as well. So then you can really start integrating that and integrating your energy. And for those who have- Good, good, good. Yes, yes. In the traditional cultures, yeah. they understood this principle and they did bring in the integrative side of the process and the purification and the integrative side of the yeah. process. So very and good. So for those who are experiencing you know, chronic pain, and they don't necessarily know where to start. Well, a wonderful place to start is actually your free gift, right? You offered a free gift to help people uh, uh, maybe kickstart their healing journey and say, hey, hey, what does this have for me? How do I find that deep connection to that oneness? And go ahead and download it now. Download it now. You got 48 hours to do that. And then, you know, if you like it, hey, reach out to, to Dorothy. You'll find that her, her website is right there. Reach out to her. Let her know what it was that you felt. Let her know what it was. Hey, if you appreciated this conversation, if you, you know liked what it was that she was saying, hey, reach out to her and let her know, hey, I loved everything that you were saying. Or maybe, hey, yes. you lost me here, but I could tell there was something cool there. Can you maybe expound yes. and reach out? There's, there's yes, nothing. Yes, because I really do want people to come into a state of personal autonomy over their own healing process. Yeah. So definitely the orientation of my work is, you know, the, the free gift gives you kind of a flavor of, of sort of the internal journey and using my words to describe how the healing process unfolds for an individual. But, but in the end, what matters to me is that you have the power over your own physiology mm -hmm. and your own experience and yeah that you're doing it, man, that you're doing it and you don't need anybody else. You don't have to depend on anybody else. No, oh, I love that. And so as, as we wrap up, do you have any maybe final words of wisdom for people who are on this journey to heal themselves, to, uh, you know, cancel? And the reason why I specifically chose the word cancel is because one, it's kind of silly to me because, you know, cancel is kind of, it, it's a, it's a word that's in our, you know, our social vernacular right now. We oh, yeah, have yeah. to use, but cancel to me also isn't kill. It isn't like eliminated. It. It's cancel in the sense of stepping out of the way in the way, in a very Taoist way, in a very flowing way. But mm -hmm. if there's somebody who's looking to cancel their chronic pain, do you have any maybe final words of wisdom to, to maybe help kickstart them on, on that journey? Yes. The purification process has an energy signature. It has a feel to it. And almost always the pain will be there when the nervous system, especially the autonomic nervous system, is wired up to resist that purification. But um, like with the peyote ceremony, because the purging is part of the ceremony, people walk into the ceremony expecting and open to the purge. And I would like to offer that the purge itself can be difficult. You know, it can have elements to it that are uncomfortable, but it's also a necessary and an essential part of the cycle of healing, the healing cycle and the evolutionary cycle. And, and understanding that will allow you to accept and receive the purging as a very beneficial and positive part of the experience and being able to do that will change your relationship with the with the pain and with the difficult situations that come and even with the darker feelings that come and all that it will change your relationship with it so that you're there's a part of you that's stepping back and witnessing 
the purge. It steps back and witnesses the purge. And when you find yourself in that position where you're stepping back and you're witnessing the purge, then it's easy to allow the flow of the purge to just complete itself as it's meant to complete itself. And then you come out the other end clear. You come mm. out the other end free of it. It's one of the ways of allowing the discomfort to complete itself, to resolve itself. Or you could say, in the case of my example, to come back home, you know, that whatever is that difficulty, it allows it to just go back to the source of creation where it can be reborn as a much finer, more useful form. Mm. Man, I love that so much. You, uh, I feel like you and I could talk for hours and hours. Yeah, I feel like we could too. Yeah. We could too, Joshua. Yeah. It's really lovely. Well, this is this has been incredible. Well, you maybe shared... we'll get to do it again. I think it would be nice. Yeah, yeah. I think it would. I think it would, I think it would be it would really be nice to do that. Um, and you know, this has been such an incredible wealth of uh, information as well as a map. You really detailed an incredible map for people to follow, and it's important to understand that this is a map. A map is not the territory, right? What she's experiencing is meant in, like you were saying, abstract, right? It's an abstract. So then you can internalize it for how your shape takes form, right? How your shape needs to be able to hold, right? That space for that music to, to erupt into life. Um, and uh, this has been incredible. I really appreciate your time. You are such a vibrant person, Dorothy. And I feel oh, blessed for, uh, for, you know, uh, being able to share space with you. And um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you. And I, I appreciate having a chance to share what I have with your listening audience and with a wider listening audience, because this is a time that we all need. We really all need to come into a state of grace and greater personal autonomy and power over our own healing experience. Yep. It's really important. Yep. It's like a survival. It's survival. Yep. So let's do it. You Absolutely. Know? Hey, let's the do it. You heard the lady. You heard the lady. Not only let's do it, but go download her free gift, right? You got go to do it. Go download, download it and, and, and you jumpstart your healing process and find a path to where you can step out of that chronic pain and step into a whole new way of being. Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank well, you. Thank you for sharing my website with everyone, Josh. Hey, my pleasure. And thank you for sharing time and space with us. And to everyone who's been watching, thank you so much for tuning in. And, uh, I hope that you got as much benefit out of it as I did. <laughs> Me too. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>